Oh, to get to you. To feel that you are wanted. That you are chosen. That you are the elect. But as we are told, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. But man will not believe it. He will not believe that he is that important. For we are speaking now of the Lord, the creator of the universe, who chose us in him before the foundation of the world. For tonight I will try to convince you that you are the chosen. The most controversial verse in Ecclesiastes, the most disputed, is the 11th verse of the third chapter. And God has put eternity into the mind of man. Yet so, that man cannot find out what God has done from beginning to the end. This is the only time in the scriptures that the word is translated eternity. In the King James Version is translated the world. The other books say Moffat, James Moffat. And he translates the word as mystery. To the mind of man he appointed mystery. Yet so, that man cannot fathom God's own purpose from beginning to end. Paul comes on and he tells us he waited for the fullness of time. And when the fullness of time came, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our heart, crying, Father, and that he has made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, both in heaven and on earth. Now, the word translated eternity or world or mystery is the Hebrew word olam. Now, this is the only place in the entire book where it is translated the world or eternity or mystery. And yet, it is used hundreds of times in the Bible. The word is olam. Here is one. And when you go to the people of Israel and they ask you, who sent you? Simply say, I am has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. The word forever is Olam. When you read the word everlasting in scripture, in the Old Testament, it is Olam. When you read all of it, it is Olam. Here in the 136th Psalm, they are 26 verses. And each verse ends with the same statement. Thy steadfast love endures forever. And that forever is Olam. Now he put Olam into the mind of man. Remember, his name endures forever. This is my name forever. What did he put into the mind of man? His name is himself. His name forever is I am. That is the immortal being who created the universe. 
His steadfast love endures forever. So into the mind of man came God himself, which is I am. That's the Lord. There is no other God. If you could only believe for one moment as you're seated here, you are aware of being. Awareness of being is actually saying without the use of words, I am. And that is God. If you could only be that you are that altogether wonderful being that he chose to give himself to, your entire world would change. You would see everything differently. To feel that I am wanted. The average person in the world feels that he is unwanted. He's unknown. And yet you are known and loved by the only presence in the world that matters. That's who you really are. You are the being that God so loved, he actually became you. That you may become God. So when you say, I am, that's God. And there is no other God. Now, in Hebrew thought, history consists of all the generations of men and their experiences fused into a single whole. And that concentrated time into which all the generations of men and experiences are fused, and from which they all spring, is called eternity. The predominant sense of the word olam is permanent. It means the continual, as again, or in contrast to the fragmentary time that quickly passes away. That something that is forever, so he put forever, which is himself, in you. So Blake could quite honestly say, all things exist in the human imagination. So when you sleep tonight, though you may not be able to pay rent, though you may think you're unknown and unwanted, dwell upon this thought. You're not only known, but you are known by the only being that really matters. And that only being so cared that he became you. He dwelled in you as your own wonderful human imagination. When you say, I am that God, there is no other God. And that is God forever and forever. That's the immortal you that cannot die. I could chop off your head right now and see the body turn into dust by putting it into the flame. Yet you cannot die. That's only a mask that you wore when I saw you. But you, the real you, cannot die. It's eternal because it is God, the real you. If you could only catch this feeling, your whole world will change. You'll feel important. You'll feel wanted. Wanted by what? The government? No, that's nothing. That's transitory. All things pass. But this one that so loved you has his not. He simply so loved you, he actually became you. And he is the eternal being in the world. You dwell upon that and your whole feeling changes concerning your value in this world, who you really are, and what you are unto. You are the chosen one. You are the elect. So let me share with you a few letters that came this week. I see a few of them here who wrote it. One lady wrote saying that she found herself in her swimming pool, and she was floating on her back. She decided to make the entire swim on her back from one end to the other. And she said, I felt that I had had too much wine. 
And I felt really to the point of capacity. And I shouted out, I have had too much wine. And then I got embarrassed that I had so much wine that even my words would not take the proper course. And I corrected myself and said, why? I said, I do enjoy a drink, but it's not wine. I like something stronger. I am not given to excessive drinking, but when I do have a drink, I like something stronger. But here it was wine. And I am floating on water in my own pool. Then she said, I felt your presence. I didn't see you. I couldn't say to anyone, I saw you. And now I cannot actually say that you were another. Yet here, I know you were present, and you and I are one. We are one, so I can no more use the word we. I will have to say I. Yet I know that you and I are one, and I cannot divide it and say we. It is simply I. And then I awoke. But she caught it perfectly. Where do you think I am going when I depart this section of time? If heaven is within you, and that's where I am headed, for all of my experiences have completed the journey in this world of tears. Where can I go but within heaven, and heaven is within you? Read the 17th chapter of the book of John. I dwell in them. In everyone that he gave me. And we are one. As thou and I are one. And I mean that seriously. We are one. Because there's only one God. So when you are weak. And you are the father of God's only begotten Son, you are God. So where are you going to go? But back to your source, which is God. And so she felt my presence, and yet you were not another that I could see. I couldn't refer to you as something, as another. I could not even use the plural and say we. And yet I knew we were one, I felt your presence, and yet it's my very being. So in the end, God played all the parts. There was nothing in the world but God. He conceived the entire play. He played all the parts, for his name forever is I Am. You say I Am, don't you? Well, that's God. I say I Am. It's the same God. It's not another God. So here, in this marvelous story, but conceal, for the word over means to hide self. It means to conceal. It means to hide from. It also means the lad, the youth, the stripling, the young man. And he put Olam into the mind of man. What did he put into the mind of man? There is only Jesus Christ. But divide the word. Jesus is the Lord. That I am. Christ is his son. It's the son of the Lord. And that Christ is David. He is the lad. So when he stands before the king, the demented king Saul. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? He first inquired of his lieutenant, Abner. To Abner, whose son is that you? As your soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. Inquire whose son the stripling is. And then when he could not find out, he brings him before the king with the head of the giant in his hand. And then the king addresses 
David. He said, whose son are you, young man? He said, I am the son of Jesse. The son of Jesse. Well, Jesse means I am. I am telling you, I am the son of God. The word Jesse means I am. It's any form of the verb to be. It means Jehovah exists. And Jehovah is yod He bal which really means I am. So he's telling you, I am the son of the one whose name forever and forever is I am. So he's telling people, but who did he put into the mind of man? He put himself and his son into the mind of man. So Paul making the discovery could say, do you not realize that Jesus Christ, which is the Lord and his anointed one, his son, are in you? And in the end of time, his purpose is revealed. God's purpose is to give himself to us. Literally. So, in the end, you awake, and his son calls you father. You tell the story of those that he gave you out of all that he has, that you may bring them to a certain level of awareness. And when you depart, where are you going to go? Into them. For where is heaven but within? So when she said, I cannot say we, I can only use the personal pronoun in its singular form, I. And yet I felt your presence and knew that we were one, but I can't use the word we. I am so much you, I can't say we. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So we come to the end, and the journey is over. I am just simply your own wonderful I am. So in the end, when the curtain comes down on the entire drama, God, who conceived the entire thing, played it all and forgave all. Forgave everyone because he played every part in the world. Now another letter, and he is here tonight, he said, through my years, I have used imagination to achieve my goal in this world. And yet I have found myself having used my imagination and I completely forgot the incident. Then it came to pass and I reaped the result. And I can't get over that belief that I intellectually did it. And so I completely forget that imagination did it. I imagined it to be done and then dropped it. And then in the interval of time it happened. I'm confronted with the evidence, and yet here I am stuck. Because I cannot get over that belief that I intellectually did it, and yet I do remember having done it in my imagination. Then he quotes several lovely passages of Scripture. He quoted the 20th chapter of Numbers. He quoted the 8th of Deuteronomy. He quoted the tenth of Isaiah and the seventh of Judges. If you read these stories, the Lord is trying to convince Israel that Israel didn't do it, that the Lord did it. So in the book of Judges, he said, I, I am now stuck. I can't understand this test that the Lord gave to Israel in the book of Judges. You'll read it in the seventh chapter. He is about to conquer Midian for Israel. And so the call goes out, and 32,000 responded. Now he gave them two tests. The first test was one based upon fear. And 22,000 of them confessed that they were afraid. So they were released from duty and sent back to their home. He still had 10,000. He thought, that's too many. For Israel would say, we did it. But if I can reduce that number from 10,000 to just a skeleton, 
against the mighty hordes of Midian, they can say that my mighty arm did it, but the Lord must have done it. So then he gave them a second death. Anyone who can lap water as the dog laps water. And so then they all had to make the test. A running brook. And those who went down on their knees were disqualified. Those who cut their hands and drank it from their hands, being alert constantly, they were drinking water. Bear in mind, the lady said she was floating on water, that she was filled with wine. The first sign in John is to turn the stone and fill it with water and then turn the water into wine. There are three levels of awareness. That solid, objective fact, the reality. Then the water is the psychological meaning of scripture. And then comes the wine, the spiritual understanding of it. So here, only 300 cupped their hands and drank from it. And they are put aside that they were the only ones who would be taken to conquer all the hordes of Midian. That Israel could not say, by my own strong hand I did it. What does it mean? That's a parable. All these are parables. It's a parable of life for all of us. Spiritual nourishment is obtained by those who, while they move along the normal natural paths of experience, feed themselves as it comes. And there are those who think there must be a special occasion, a retreat for my meditation, a withdrawal from the world. I must actually put myself apart and be something entirely different for the Spirit of God to come upon me. May I tell you, they will wait and wait and wait for a number of years, and it will not come that way. Go about your father's business, go into the marketplace, and whatever you were doing, do it, but always remember the Lord. So they cut their hands, but they were alert. They didn't get them on their knees and bury their head in the running stream. They cut their hands and they were alert, or they were on a journey. 300. So he reduced it from 32,000 to 300. So I say to him, you feel that you take the credit for your intellectual accomplishment. And you know from experience that you did precede that with an imaginal act. And then you forgot the imaginal act. But the imaginal act didn't forget itself. It came to pass, and you reap the harvest of what you had done imaginally, knowing you did not really accomplish it with your own intellectual power. Well, go back to see now. You do not need any withdrawal from this world for spiritual nourishment. None whatsoever. If you think you need some special occasion, if you need some little retreat where you can go and meditate, you have the wrong concept of God. For he is in you. We're going to go to find him more than where you can find him wherever you are. If you're standing at a bar, he is present. No matter where you are this night, he is present in you. He is not in any holy place in the world. Wherever you are, that's the holy place. <laughs> there is no cathedral in the world. No so-called holy place called a, a sanctified cemetery. Cemetery is what? He is buried in you. You are the sepulchre where God is buried. He is not buried in any cemetery in this world. He never was. He is buried in the skull of man. That's where he's buried. So a lady now writes from San Francisco. And she said, you know, I had the strangest dream, and I can't understand it. I met you. Here you are expounding scripture. 
And then you came over to me and you embraced me. And I pushed you away. And I said, no, Neville. What I did, I do not know. She didn't say that in the letter. And then she said, I said to her, you know, I would have married you. And she said, but I am married. And I said, yes, I know. But the day will come, you will know that Jerry, that's her husband, and I are one. It was not a union of sex. It's a union of my teaching. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is the teaching. So she loves it. She has the records because she made them herself at the last meeting in San Francisco. So she made ten. And she tells me she plays them over and over, and he made others before that. So they must have maybe 30 or 40 of these recordings. But she hasn't quite absorbed it. Or she could not have said no. For there will be no sex in this. It's a union with God. For I am telling you, I became one with him when he embraced me. So we are no longer two. Just as my friend said, I can't use the pronoun we. I will use now the singular. I, and yet I feel your presence, and I am you. And yet I haven't lost my identity. And I can tell you from my own experience, for all the sameness of identity, when this thing happens, there is a radical change in form. <coughs> It's not this form at all. It's spirit. Now take these words and see if you aren't shocked by them. In the book of Proverbs, the 8th chapter, the 22nd verse, the Lord created me at the beginning of his way, the first of his acts of old. Look up the word beginning at the beginning of his way. And this is the definition given in Strongest Concordance. To shake the head. The top. The beginning is when that head of yours vibrates so you think this is the end and it's only then the beginning. When your head so vibrates that you think this is it, meaning to yourself, never having experienced anything comparable to this, that this is the end of what the world would call now your dying. Far from dying, the Lord shook the head. He vibrated the head. And that vibration woke you. Who did you wake? If you would be asked, who heard it? And who actually was wicked when he heard it and felt it? You would answer, I. I am waking. And who found himself within the tomb and knew it to be his own skull? You would answer, I. And who then knew how to come out? You would say, I. And who came out? You would say, I. And who found the child? I knew it to be his own. I. So the I is buried in man. And it's God. And it comes with the vibration of the head. When the whole head begins to shake. It is the shaking of the head. Rosh, we have a new year. We speak of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh is the shaking of the head. It's not another year pass by and I mark it off the calendar and go to another year. This is an entirely new age when that head shake. You can mark off year after year. We call this now the year 1972. And the Jew speaks of their year going back over five centuries. I mean 5,000 years. But that's not the rush of the Rosh Hashanah that scripture speaks of. It speaks of the shaking of the head, of the top, and then it goes on to say, the firstborn, 
the first fruit. All these are the definitions given to Rosh. When the head begins to shake, then you come out. And you are born from the top. You are born from God. And all ends run through to origin. So if the origin is God, the end is God. It is God that is born. So then you are in this world. You are now only an extension of the Lord. For he explains himself in those that are born. Born from above. But all will be born from above. And that's how God expands and expands and expands himself. So he has put eternity into the minds of men. Yet so, that man cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Nevertheless, at that end, he does make known his purpose. As Paul said in his letter to the Ephesians, he has made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. So when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, who is Christ, which is David, crying in our hearts, Father. And you look up, and he is your son, and he has called you father. Who did he call father? He's calling God father. And God is your own wonderful I am. Who did he call? He's calling me father. I am his father. And everyone is going to have that experience. So in the end, as my friend had the experience, we are one. We are not two. I dwell in them, and they dwell in me, and we are one. Keep them in thy name, O Holy Father. And the love that thou gavest me is the love you give them, that they may be one as we are one. So I am not a God afar off, says I am a brother and a friend. But man will not believe it. And he turns down, tired and weary, he turns down the valley of God. He won't believe it. He can't believe that the one he dislikes is himself. He can't believe it that the man who stole from him this day is himself. He can't believe that the man who gave him good this day is himself. They're all separate. And I'm not saying that you're going to be absorbed as her words are beautifully told in her letter. I felt your presence. The identity was there. No question about it. But for all the sameness of identity, we are one. I didn't lose my identity, and yet I am, and I am you. And your presence is an identity, and yet I cannot use the plural in speaking of we are floating on the water. So she was filled with wine. Are we not told in Paul's letters to Timothy, drink no more water. Use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your many infirmities. Do not constantly absorb the law and apply only the law towards the getting of things in this world. From now on, let it become wine, let it become spirit, so it becomes a part of you. So you drink wine, not the little bottle of wine, although I'm very fond of wine. I love it. Have my full bottle of wine today with some cheese for my lunch. I thoroughly enjoy the fifth of wine and old oh, affection of Edan. Thoroughly enjoyed it. But that's not the wine spoken of in Scripture. The wine is the transforming of the water into wine. That psychological law is forever. Apply it towards becoming the man, becoming the woman that you want to be. But it's enough after a while to become this, become that, become the other. Set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the unveiling of Jesus Christ within you. 
when the Father is unveiled, and it can only be unveiled through his Son, who reveals you as his Father. And that is the story. So he has put, yes, I would use the word eternity, I use the word world, for he has put everything within you. <coughs> you don't have to go outside of self to find anything. You find it within you. And by applying the principle, you rest having done what you are supposed to do, and let it come to pass. But do not forget, as my friend so wisely said in quoting these passages from Scripture, that he finds it so difficult, trained as he is, he's a college graduate, he's a professional psychiatrist, teaching psychiatry to many, and he finds it difficult not to claim that his own intellectual powers brought these to pass, even though he remembers that there was a moment in time when he, not intellectually, but when he imagined a state by denying the evidence of the senses, by denying reason, or reason did not come into it, because they denied what he is now doing in imagination. And having done it, he forgot it. And then, in good time, it happened in this world, and he reaped the harvest of what he did in imagination. But he said, I find it so difficult, trained as I am, not to take the credit. And that's exactly what these passages that he quoted in the scripture is against. They will not give the credit where it belongs. They are taking it to themselves, their own puffed up intellectual state. And this whole vast thing is so unlike what the world believes it to be. The whole vast world. I haven't time tonight to develop it. I will on Monday. To show you that everything in this world, on this level, is so unlike what it is on the next higher level. And man can't believe it. Until he's had that experience, he can't believe that this is not what it appears to be. But I'll show it to you on Monday. But hear that most disputed verse in the book of Ecclesiastes, the 11th verse of the third chapter. And God has put eternity into the mind of man, but so that man cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. But in the fullness of time, shows it to those to whom he now comes at the end of time. He doesn't, con he does not consign them to silence. They may go and tell it to the best of their ability exactly how it happened. So when Ecclesiastes tells us that we will never find out, no, in the end you do find out God's own purpose. You find his mystery, and his mystery is to actually literally give himself to us, that his steadfast love forever, and that is over forever. And thy name will endure forever. That is over. The word everlasting is made an everlasting covenant with me. That word is over. David's last words in the second book of Samuel, the 23rd chapter. And he has made with me an everlasting covenant. And that word is Olam. It is forever and forever. And so he will now be a witness for all generations. He will always come at that appointed moment when I need to be revealed as to who I am. And David will rise. And here, I'm looking into the face of my son. But I know that scripture told me he was God's son. But I have no feeling of God as another. He has so become me that I am his father. So she was perfectly right in saying I can't use the plural. I can't say we are his father. He has so become me that I am. His father. And so she, in the floating, filled with wine, 
And may I tell us, don't be embarrassed because you said you were filled with swine. The pig has been the symbol of the Savior throughout all the generations. And so, you've eaten of him. You've eaten his blood, you drank his blood, and you ate his flesh. Which means you actually absorb the teaching. That's how you eat it. You eat it by absorbing the teaching. Now, another friend of mine, she's here tonight, and she writes, but here I had this vision. I am in a cathedral. And there are this enormous choir. And there are two persons present writing out a number of my death. And I said, but I am not dead. Look, I am alive. But they're all writing out announcements, announcing my death. Then the choral group burst forth into this most glorious hallelujah. This song of praise, hallelujah, praise Jehovah. That's what the word would mean. And I joined him with the chorus singing of my own death. Death to what? It is death to this level. Death to this level. She joined with the choral group in singing her own departure from this level, moving into another level. So I'm telling you, you're all a witness. My letters are now becoming more and more along this line. This week I must have received at least two dozen. I had to give one today to a friend of mine to ask her to please answer this for me, because I don't have the time, and yet I hunger for the letters. But if they demand an answer, as this one did, an interpretation because they're not here, they are a thousand miles away. And that, that has to be answered. But you who are here, I can answer your letters from the platform. But those would come, say, like my friend from San Francisco, I haven't answered that yet. It's been there for ten days. But I may get to it this weekend. But I have so much to do at home with my wife but I do not have the time to answer that. If I can answer them from the platform, it's a tremendous help. So here, I hope I have convinced you this night how wonderful you are, that you were chosen, not by some head of government. What would it matter tonight if you had the Stalin Medal? And so many were given the Stalin Medal and the Hitler Medal. Well, you should know this. But to be chosen by the creator of the universe. He so loved you that he became you. And his name is forever and forever. And his name is I Am. And it's buried in you. That's God in you. Sleep in the feeling of being so wanted, being so chosen, being the elect. And you cannot rise feeling unwanted and feeling shunted in this world. 